and then get things started. So um, if you're not speaking today, just keep yourself muted, so keep the background noise down and um, we'll take questions. So if you have any, um, put them in the chat and we'll bring them up to Chris in the middle if necessary. And then raise your hand too, if there's something, if I don't, if we don't see your, your question in the chat, we can take it. And we'll also have an opportunity at the end for questions and conversation with, with Chris. But let me let me get started. Last time Chris was with us was um, hold on just a second was this time last year, and uh, normally we usually have you back twice. But for whatever reason, we I don't think we were able to get you on the schedule for the fall. So I'm excited because lots happened since last year, and looking forward to having you update us on what's going on in today's economy. I'm going to give a little background to Chris and who he is, and then I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, Chris is the managing director of Armada Corporate Intelligence. He provides uh, forecasts and strategic guidance for a variety of corporate clients around the world. He's the economist for several national and international organizations, the Fabricators Manufacturers Association, American Supply Association, Chemical Coders Organization International, and many others. He's also the econom economic analyst for several state accounting societies, including Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Minnesota, North Dakota, Kansas, and probably a few more since we last talked. Um, prior to joining Armada in 1999, Chris was professor of economics and finance for 15 years, teaching in Hungary, Russia, Estonia, Singapore, and Taiwan. He holds advanced degrees in economics, Soviet studies, and East Asian studies. He's the co-author of their flagship and strategic intelligence system, both publications from Armada. So with that, uh, there's probably a lot more to tell about Chris, but that's kind of a snapshot of his background. I'm going to turn it over to him and uh, for the rest of the session. So take it, Chris. All right. Very good. Well, you know, you're talking about your good turnout. See, the thing is that you know that you're listening to an economist that speaks to accountants. So what you've done is told all of your bosses that you're involved in a webinar, but you're really going to take a nap because, you know, you've, you've got an economist and it's like with any minute now, the droning of economics will lull you right to sleep. So... Yeah, it's been a year, uh, which is good, because if you'd heard me more recently, you'd know how badly we have been miscalculating, and that's always embarrassing. And that's why I always like to start with J.K. Galbraith's comment. The only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. Um, we are immensely bad at what it is we ostensibly do. Um, we are supposedly forecasters. We make weathermen look good. Um, so it's it's going to be talking a little bit about what we thought was going to happen, why it didn't, um, what we think is going to happen, and why you didn't pay any attention whatsoever to what I'm going to say, um, and kind of go from there. Like, you must understand that my father was an engineer, and he always looked at me with dismay and said, how come you went to the dark side? and became an economist. And I said, well, you're an engineer. If you make a mistake, a building falls down. If I make a mistake, A, no one's surprised, and B, no one cares. Um, so I just didn't want the stress. So here we go. A few things to get out of the way right off the bat, just to, to kind of set the tone. It's an election year, and the media is going to go nuts because it always does. I mean, it just thinks this is like a sporting event. And so it's just going to be wall-to-wall -wall coverage. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be distressing. For the business community, it barely matters. Um, business does what business does. And we're all well aware that virtually every company on the planet gives to both sides because they don't like either one and they are basically saying look i need access to whichever one of you idiots wins and so i'm i'm going to give money to you i'm going to give money to the other side and when it comes up and i need to talk to you don't throw me out of your office 83 percent of the time a presidential election just did not matter to them working there have only been four times on 24 elections that the s p 500 declined and i would argue that none of those four had anything to do with an election. 1932, well, hey, you know, the Great Depression might have been a bigger factor. Um, 1940, 
World War II was kind of a big deal um, and was preoccupying people. 2000, 2008, both recession years. So what really matters to most business and CE, COOs know it better than most is local. I mean, it's what's happening in the community. It's what's happening in the state. Um, many of the decisions that are of most important, everything from you know, where you're located, the transportation network that you're part of, you know, the workforce situation, very little of that is done at the national level. I mean, it's really at the local level, state level, and oftentimes it's an education process. I mean, when I talk to people in business about what matters and, and what they should be doing politically, I said, to be honest, most of the people who are making decisions that matter to you don't have a clue how your business runs. They don't have any idea what your inputs are. They don't have any idea what your issues are. They're unfamiliar in in every respect. So they need to be educated. I mean, this week is a classic example of the kind of groups that I speak to on a regular course and all over the place. And Monday, I'm in Phoenix speaking to McDonald's franchise owners. Now, what matters to them is wages and worker availability. What matters to them are input costs. What matters to them are the attitude of consumers and specifically consumers that are interested in fast food. I mean, they don't have big overarching positions on on some of the things that will be discussed in the election because it just doesn't matter to them. The very next day, I'm speaking to tech people in... Tampa, TD Cinex, they distribute Intel and Dell and all that kind of stuff. Well, they're completely preoccupied with technology, how people are adapting to AI, you know, what is it that's coming out of the technical world? Again, much more focused. Many of the decisions are local. And then on Wednesday, I'm in Cleveland speaking to a company that manufactures for the combustion sector of manufacturing. And, you know, again, it, the issue is that it's a French company that's mostly produces here and their issues. I mean, they're selling to companies that use combustion equipment. Every single company has very, very focused needs. And the COO is usually the one that when nobody else knows what to do, they throw it to the COO. You know, the CFO is saying, save money, save money, save money. And the CEO is, you know, up there making all kinds of grand statements. And then at the end of the day, they all look at the CEO and say, you figure it out. Um, so it's, it's, it's the original thankless task. And so what has been going on? What is us off so badly? I mean, we'll look at a chart here in a minute that shows how badly we were predicting all last year. I mean, in first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, everyone was talking, everyone in economics anyway, recession or slowdown or something. And we just kept blowing through those predictions. I mean, fourth quarter, we're sitting at 3.3%. The prediction was that we were going to be in recession or at least less than one. And we blew right past it. We're still looking at, at new numbers coming out. Third quarter, we were over 5%, and that was supposed to be 1% too. So what what's going on? Why are we so far wrong? This isn't being missed by a quarter point or a half point. This is missing it by three points or more. So right off the bat, you can see what's been driving things. That blue bar, consumer spending, 57.8% of the GDP. And that's roughly four times what was being predicted because the economist looks at the consumer right now and says, look, you should be heading back. I mean, there's $7 trillion in credit card debt. There's $20 trillion in overall debt. Don't you people look at your bills? Don't you see that you're up to your eyebrows in debt? And the consumer just looks back and says, I don't care. I still have checks. I can't be broke. Um, I still have a job. I don't care. I am going to pay my MasterCard with my Visa. I'm going to keep spending. And we've had quarter after quarter after quarter 
of solid spending. Now, there's a real difference in terms of who is doing the spending and who isn't, which we'll get to in a minute. But we consistently underestimate the consumer. We keep thinking that they're really going to start paying attention to their debt load. But the bottom line is the consumer wants to consume. That's what we do best. And what really controls their desire is their job security. And we're going to come back to that over and over again, because the issue for many companies has been workforce. It's been wage inflation. It's been how to cope with attrition, how to deal with retirement. It goes on and on and on. The upshot for the individual is that they just have concluded that their jobs are secure forever. And even if they don't keep that job, every time they go out, they pass 300 help wanted signs. You know, so they're like, look, I don't, what the hell? I mean, I'm, I'm employed. As long as I've got employment, I can do whatever I want. The key, of course, is that if anything ever changes and suddenly you start to see mass layoffs, well, the consumer begins to get very shaky very quickly. Mm -hmm. At the moment, they're not seeing a lot of that on the horizon. What's also interesting is what people are spending their money on. 19% of what was spent in quarter four was healthcare. Another 14% was recreation. Another 19% eating out. I mean, you add all those together, and that's the bulk of what was spent in Q4. And it's really interesting kind of who's doing that spending. You know, what's driving healthcare? Old people. It's boomers. Um, we have been driving the economy since we were born. Used to be we drove demand for toys. Then we drove demand for things that teenagers do. And then we drove demand for homes. And we drove, well, now we're demanding health care. It's like, hi, I'm a boomer. I'm wearing out. I don't like it. I need a new hip. I need a new everything. I need a refit. It's like, isn't there a pill for this? An elixir, something. Um, and so we're driving healthcare. Recreation sales, well, it's the upper income that has money right now. We'll talk a little bit about the K recovery here in a minute. But right now, yacht builders have reported a four year waiting list. They cannot keep up with demand. The things that are selling are expensive because the people who have money are the ones who are doing most of the spending. And we're still seeing a response to the end of the lockdown that people are still eating out. Now they're eating out differently than they were. You've kind of seen a, a bit of a shakeout, which again reflects the distribution of income. The upper end restaurants are doing fine. The lower end restaurants are feeling a little bit of a pinch, but they're still hanging in there. It's that mid range. The mid-range is suddenly losing consumers to the bottom range, to the fast food, or they're just not able to attract the higher end because the higher end is saying, oh, look, I mean, you know, if I go to an Applebee's, I'm going to blow 100 bucks, and I'm not really getting 100 bucks worth of uh, worth, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the upper end restaurant, spend 200 bucks, but at least I'm going to get good service and, you know, all that stuff. So a lot of, of differentiation in terms of how people are spending. So here were some of the predictions. I mean, you know, going back to 2023, if you'd looked at this a year ago, quarter one was supposed to be in recession, so on and so forth. We got 5.2. Even three weeks ago, people were saying, oh, quarter one of this year is going to be a recession. Well, okay, now we've changed our mind. Well, it's going to be a little bit of growth. My estimates right now, looking at our data, we're going to be 2.53% in the first quarter, probably the same in the second quarter. The Armada models are showing more of a decline in the second half of the year than in the first half, but that's based on a couple of assumptions around employment and a few other factors, which we'll talk about. So here it is, the K recovery. We economists like to give recessions letter names. So we've had the V recession, where it goes down in a hurry and goes back up. Those are our favorite because they don't last very long. Then you have the U recovery, which is down in a hurry, lingers for a while, then comes back in a hurry. We've had the checkmark recession, where it goes down in a hurry and then takes its sweet time coming back. 
Now we're talking about the K. So the K recovery is the upper income is doing fine. Um, they ended up holding a lot of that money that was distributed during the recession year, the pandemic year, and they're still spending it. Many of these upper income, I mean, I can see it even when I'm traveling. About a year ago, when I would go to the nice resort hotels for a conference, the conference attendees were dominating the hotel. I mean, that's all you saw. Now, when I'm going to these resort places, well, the regular tourists are back. And the hotels are kind of shoving the conference people. It's like, okay, we put up with you before because we needed you. But you're not our core because you're not in the spa. You're not playing golf. You're not taking advantage of what we have here. You're just clogging up the conference rooms. I've been at a couple of conferences now where the conference organizers said they took rooms away from us. We had booked so many rooms, but they've had real tourists coming in and they're like, out, out. The people that just came in to stay for the weekend, they're going to blow $2,000 on the amenities of the hotel you're in. So it's a definite shift towards that upper end. The lower end is where the problem is. 85% of those are living paycheck to paycheck. And that's the group that is most vulnerable should there be layoff development or something of that type. And then all the focus is on the middle. Are they going to get to lower income trouble, 55% of them are living paycheck to paycheck, or are they going to hold their own, maybe even drift up further into the upper income category? But that's where a lot of the attention is right now, because that, that will be the group that depends or determines how the economy grows this year. Inflation is under control. Um, we are almost where the Fed wants to be. The Fed has said that their goal is 2% to 2.5% at the PCE level. And we're there. We already have that in the six-month inflation rate. We're close when it comes to the 12-month rate. What is causing the Fed some hesitance when it comes to things like lowering rates, because you would think now that inflation is, quote, defeated, the Fed can start to lower rates again, They'll point out that the reason that the inflation rate has come down has been energy, commodity cost, food cost, things that are traditionally volatile. So the Fed is like, well, yeah, it looks really good right now. We're really pleased. However, the thing that is not changing is wage inflation. And that's what causes that wage price spiral. And that is like the death knell for an economy from an economist can do. Wages go up because the worker has leverage and they're like, hey, there's not enough of us and we're going to demand this money. So the company has no choice, but they have to meet that wage demand. Then, of course, they have to look at their production and say, look, if we're going to be paying this much more in labor costs, we're going to have to raise our prices. And then the worker with leverage comes back and says, hey, prices went up. I need more money. It's like, I know prices went up. You think they went up because you asked for more money. It's like, well, okay, but I still need more money and I have leverage. So let's get with the program. And, and then you just get this spiral and they just keep going. At, going in. McDonald's people you know, all over the country, average wage now, 20 bucks. And I says, what do you think that does to the price of a McDonald's hamburger? It's like if we're paying somebody $20 and they tried to tell us that, oh, well, if you pay 20 bucks, you're going to get a better class of worker. No, we don't. It's the same person we always hired. It's the same person that used to work for half that money. They still screw it up. They still show up late. They still don't show up at all. They're the same dinks we always had. We're just paying twice what we used to pay to have them. And at some point, you know, something breaks. I mean, it's it's <clears throat> economics is fundamentally a philosophy. And when you get differences of opinion among economists, it's usually because of their philosophical position. And by now, people who have listened to me for a while know that I'm a Friedmanite. I'm a Chicago school guy. Not that I went to that school, but Milton Friedman is my hero. He had a very simple taxonomy. 
when it came to business. And it sometimes flies in the face of, of what's being promulgated today. He said the number one priority for a business is the investor owner. If there is no incentive to invest in a business, if there's no incentive in starting one and owning one, there won't be one. The most important thing is the owner. Because they're the ones that are taking all the risks. They're the ones that borrowed money. They're the ones that have started the company. They're the ones, I mean, and I'm sure you guys experience it all the time. When I talk to business owners, you know, and almost invariably, I said, would it make more sense if you went to work for somebody else rather than trying to run your own company? And they all come back and say, oh, God, yeah, I'd make more money working as an employee than running my own company. I mean, there are months where I don't make anything at all because that's the demands of the market at that particular point. So from Friedman's point of view, got to take care of the investor, got to take care of the owner. Number two is the customer. If you don't have customers, you don't have a business. Number three is the employee. And it's like, we've got this thing flipped now where the employee is driving the train. And he said, at some point, you're going to have to face the fact that if there are no customers and there are no investors and no owners, there's no point in having an employee. So that employee has to understand where they fit in that panoply, and they generally don't. Um, so it's one of the – I just got through this morning doing a, a webinar to HR professionals, and, oh, man, I mean, every single commentary that was provided, it was like, what does it take to motivate people now? You can't pay them because they don't care, you know? And it's like – and I said, well, you know, you look at some of the, the data and just things like Gen Z males – 40% of Gen Z males have indicated that they will not leave their parents' home until they're in their 30s. So it's kind of like they don't care how much money they make. They're living in their mom's basement, you know, and she's still cooking their meals and cleaning their clothes. And, you know, what do they need a job for? You know, so what's interesting is 40% of the males, it's 15% of the females. It's like the Gen Z girls are like, let me out of here. Um, but <laughs> the sons are like, oh, man, but I'm never going to make level 77 if I move. You know, so anyway, can you tell I'm a boomer? So so here we have the dot plot. Here we have, you know, if, if, if inflation is under control and all that kind of stuff, what's the Fed going to do? The dot plot is created by looking at the commentary from the Board of Governors and the 12 regional Fed presidents. What are they saying about the future of rates? Most of the time, the dot plot looks like it did in 23, where they're all basically on the same page, not a lot of difference of opinion. When you start getting into 24 and 25, the variations become ridiculous. I mean, look at 25. You've got people who think it's going to stay where it is now. And you've got people who think it's going to be under two, you know, I mean, so it's like that's quite a range. What it's all depending on is the job market, the inflation rates and and whether or not there is a real need to start dropping rates, because the Fed is like every other central bank. Their their mantra is that we raise rates until we break something. Once we've broken it, then we lower rates to fix what it was we broke. And one of the ways they determine that they've broken something is employment. So as long as the unemployment rate is low, the Fed and the Central Bank of Europe and Bank of England, Bank of Japan, all of them, they basically have the attitude that, well, we can keep rates higher because we obviously haven't broken the economy yet. There's still lots of employment. Recession is pushed off yet another quarter. There's no urgency. We don't have to do this. We're not facing recession. And beyond all that, and again, it's it's back to economics as a philosophy. Economists, central bankers basically do not rank recession as nearly as much of a problem as inflation. They look at recession saying, you know, it's not that bad. Most people survive recession. A lot of companies actually prosper during one. Um, of the Fortune 100, 
65 of them started or grew during a recession. Because if you're doing well during a recession, well, you can buy up your competitor. You can buy up downstream or upstream. If you're doing well as an individual during a recession, hell, everything's on sale. So you can do very well during a recession. So the attitude of the central bankers is they're both problems, but one is much worse than the other because inflation kills you no matter who you are. If you're in the lower income, you suddenly find yourself unable to buy what you need to buy. But if you're in the upper income, the average price of a car is now $46,000, which is $10,000 more than it was in 2020. So in four years, it has gone up 10 grand. So if you're wealthy and you want to buy a $100,000 car, you can, but you're also looking at that going, man, that sucker was 80000 three years ago. I'm not getting an additional thirty, twenty thousand $20,000 worth of value. It's the same car. I'm just paying an outrageously higher price for it. So inflation just destroys the value of your money. And it just commensurately makes you poor. You know, you're sitting there going, yeah, well, I'm still making all this money, but I can't buy nearly as much as I used to buy. And that's what's changing all these consumer habits. I mean, watching people change the way they eat. You know, they used to just go into a, a restaurant and not worry about it. But now they're like, good Lord, man, that's 150 bucks. And what did I get? I didn't get anything. You know, I got a handful of food that was probably worth about four bucks. And I got a surly waiter that practically threw it in my lap. Now, I'm just going to buy a frozen pizza and stay home next time. Um, so one of the things that is showing positive and continues to, and probably the one thing arguing against a recession is capital spending. And it is still setting records. It is still higher than it has been in a decades. And it's still being driven by the same thing. It's being driven by robotics, technology, automation, AI, you name it. In the era of a worker shortage, you can't find people. So you end up replacing them with machines. And you've certainly seen it in manufacturing. You've certainly seen it in construction. It's getting into the service sector in ways that it never did before. And I tell this story a lot, but it's just illustrative of what's going on. I'm in a restaurant in St. Louis at a conference, and I go down for breakfast, and I get a little device, which I think is the pager that is going to tell me to come pick up my food. Oh, no, it's connected to a robot named Marge. And Marge comes rolling over in her apron, says Marge, and chirpily says, good morning, you ordered Eggs Benedict, a glass of orange juice, and a cup of coffee. Would you like to sample your coffee to see if it's the right temperature? Best service I've gotten in months. I mean, so I talked to the guy afterwards. I said, what possessed you? This can't be cheap. And he goes, nope. But it was the kind of people I had to hire as servers. They didn't show up half the time. If they did, they were drunk or stoned or didn't care. And I have two kinds of customers here. I've got business people here for the meetings, or I've got my elderly that come in to play in the casino. Neither one of them want to deal with surly jerks as servers. The elderly love Marge. They talk to her for 20 minutes. Um, she doesn't say much, but she's a good listener. And it's like, he said, man, I, I'm never going to go back. I mean, I don't have breakage. I don't have theft. I don't have any of these things that I used to have. And... And I mean, I was watching this table mess with Marge, you know, it was like they kept sending her back because the coffee wasn't right. And in eight times, I watched these guys just screw with this robot and she'd run back and get another cup of coffee and bring it back and then keep. Can you imagine what a person would have done to your coffee by that time? I mean, there would have been like a rat floating in it by this point, but not Marge. She just came rolling up about now. About now, about now. I mean, so the robot apocalypse is here. So among the things that Armada does, and you guys are aware of this, we've we've let you know about this stuff and all this jazz. So again, kind of a plug. But this is the watch which we developed four or five years ago, and without bragging, 
this thing has been about 95, 96% accurate quarter after quarter, month after month. And um, the reason for this is the guy that built our models is a retired lieutenant colonel who used to be in the artillery. And he pointed out that in his previous incarnation, accuracy was really, really, really important. Um, and he was developing a very sophisticated system. You know him well. He's a, a CEO forum leader in the Kansas City area. Um, so he's he's been our, our partner for many, many years now. But the remarkable thing about the watch is data that it's been spitting out regarding critical parts of the economy, like non-residential construction. Look at the trend line and look at how far above the trend line we still are when it comes to non-residential construction. Lots and lots of angst over the lack of office building development and retail development is down. But what's not talked about much is the surge in things related to warehousing and transportation and logistics and cross-docking and all that stuff. I mean, the change in the supply chain has been profound, plus the expansion of healthcare. You know, you look at that number from a few slides back, that biggest spending category for the consumer was healthcare. Well, that's reflected in all the construction activity. It used to be when you would see a strip mall going up, you were waiting to see what retailer was going to move in there and or maybe a dry cleaner or something. Now it's like, oh, it's going to be an imaging center. It's going to be a new medical thing. I mean, every strip mall that goes up, it's like surgery while you wait. Um, you know, you just pull up, you flop your seat back, they reach in through the driver's window, do a little work, pop out the appendix, slap you on the back and off you go. Um, you know, it's drive through. And but that is just huge. I mean, it's it's dominating a lot of the construction sector along with all that warehouse activity. You also see a lot of reaction to where people are moving. There is an exodus out of places that are high tax, high cost of living. So you see a lot of movement out of California, seeing a lot of movement out of the North, Northwest as well and the Northeast. You're also still seeing people leave urban areas for areas that are more suburban. So you look at the West Coast and you see all the movement out of San Francisco and L.A. doesn't go very far. Nevada, Arizona, moving into Utah, moving into Idaho, for crying out loud. You know, I mean, really, you know, Boise is one of the fastest growing communities in the country. Spokane, Coeur Lane, you know, all of a sudden... And I can even tell just because of where conferences are being held. You know, the last two conferences I've done in the Northwest, Spokane, not Seattle, Spokane, you know, and all of a sudden, Bozeman has become a destination. It's like, well, you know, you can see where the movement is. You can see the movement out of urban areas. Center Dallas is losing population. Suburban Dallas has turned Oklahoma into a suburb. I mean, so, and then you see all the movement into the north, north, the southeast, north, what am I saying? North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida keeps picking up population, but they're all old, so who cares? Um, you know, Florida, it's the black hole of transportation. Everything comes in, nothing comes out. Um, so it's, it's, but it's continuing to boom. When housing starts have made a bit of a recovery. Um, you're seeing it in the single family sector as well as multifamily. And it's reflecting that movement. I mean, as people are leaving other areas and moving to new areas, well, it's creating a demand for housing. So even when you see national numbers showing a little bit of distress, it does not reflect what's happening regionally. I mean, one of the fastest growing states in the country of all places is South Dakota. And part of that is driven by transportation and the like, but it's just cost of living. You know, people are able to work wherever they want to. Uh, you're seeing a, a continued development of, of remote work and independent work. Oklahoma, for example, Tulsa still has a program where they will pay you $10,000, move to Tulsa if you keep your original job. And one entire company in San Francisco, all 22 of them, moved to Tulsa. 
you know, the owner just said, hey, you know, I can get you all a $10,000 bonus, which does not come out of my paycheck if we all move to Tulsa. And they all did. And the only woman that was a little dubious was the woman with two teenage daughters. Not sure they would be thrilled with leaving the Bay Area. But then she pointed out with the money that she was going to make selling her bungalow, she was going to buy each of them a horse. And now they're both barrel racers. And, then, and I talked to her not long ago, and she said, another bonus I hadn't anticipated, my older daughter was dating a pretty sketchy guy in San Francisco. I wasn't too happy. The guy she's dating now calls me ma'am. It's like, you know, I'm I'm all over this Oklahoma move. Um, this, this was good planning. So retail, back to retail and why it's growing so aggressively. I mean, the attitude of the U.S. consumer is that, you know, as long as I have a job, I can spend. But that trend has been dramatic for for years. And And one of the things that's even more interesting, look back to 2008. That was a serious recession and consumer spending barely slowed. It came down and then came right back up into normal range within a year or two. We came off of the 2020 recession like we were on fire. I mean, once we were able to get back into our routines, we got back into our routines. And we did it with with record speed. Um, last year, last holiday season, we had another good and somewhat unexpected surge. I don't know why it's unexpected. It happens every year, uh, but every year there is the gloom and doom guys, and we're saying, "Oh well, you know, this is the year that retail." Every single year we see retail saved by the same phenomenon, and we've talked about this before. The American male saves Christmas, and we do it every year. We do not believe that Christmas will be on the 25th. We are quite convinced it will be in March, and we have plenty of time to shop. And all of a sudden, it's two days before Christmas, and we realize we have not bought anything for anybody. The National Retail Federation did a study a few years back and discovered that of the men who shop the last two days before Christmas, 50% of what they buy is purchased at a convenience store. So if you have been the proud recipient of a six-pack and a scratcher's ticket, you now know why. So we buy whatever crap is available. The retailers know this. We put all the stuff they have left out on tables because they know that we won't go more than 25 feet into a store. And we buy this junk. We bring it to our wives and daughters and mothers and sisters, and they give us that look and go back to the store after Christmas to exchange what we got them for what they really want and spend two to three times what we spent on the original gift. If we thought we were being clever and gave them a gift card, and nothing says, I love you, honey. We've been married for 30 years. Buy yourself something nice. He does and spends four to five times the value of the gift card. Um, so, by sending legions of angry women into the stores after Christmas, we save the holiday season every year. And another little clue about retailers, retailers know that men will not go anywhere near a lingerie section. So if they want to direct you to a certain part of the store, they just put the bras and panties there and then you immediately like, oh, my God, and you go the other direction. Um, so, you know, it is it is just perfect. It's like whatever women see, what we see are like alligators and, and we're, we're terrified of them. And we just immediately go the other way. So retailers have got us figured out. Retail spending still strong. We still see it advancing really through the middle of this year, a little bit of a slowdown going after that, but still staying well above trend. And that exponential almost growth just continues. And another factor that has really just started to develop and is going to play a bigger role as the year goes on, China is now starting to essentially export deflation. China has had a whole series of really serious economic issues that they're not coping with very well. Property market has fallen apart completely. The stock market has crashed. There has been a dramatic decrease in consumer prices. The latest consumer price index from China 
showed it down almost a point, and it's now four months in a row that that has been dropping. So the export prices coming out of China have been commensurately falling. So a lot of the motivation for reshoring and finding new locations has been driven by the fact that prices got higher in China that are now coming down fast. So it's going to have this ripple on effect. It's not only going to make it a little more consumer centric because we're going to see a big surge of Chinese goods that are price lower than they've been for the last year or two. But that's also going to slow down some of that reshoring activity because companies that were looking at reshoring probably still are because the transportation issue is still as much a problem as it always was. But the urgency will be gone. You're going to have companies saying, yeah, I'm still going to reshore. I'm still going to do all that. But wow, man, right now, prices out of China are low. And so I don't need to necessarily do this right away. I'm going to take advantage of, of some of that that discounting that's coming out of China. So we were going to be going from obsessing about inflation to worrying about deflation um, in a not too distant future. If you look at manufacturing globally, it's beginning to improve, including here. Uh, this is the Purchasing Managers Index. And Generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of surveys because, you know, they have a tendency to be flaky. Um, there's a tendency for people to lie through their teeth when they're doing surveys. My favorite example of this is remember back when Nielsen would send you a little booklet to find out what you were watching on TV. And so you'd fill it out yourself and you'd send it in. And and that's when Nielsen would come back with these these very uplifting conclusions saying 70% of the American public watches PBS for at least four or five hours a day. And so people would be writing in, yes, I just watched a seven-hour documentary on dung beetles, and it was fascinating. Well, then Nielsen started putting the box in the TV to see what we were actually watching. And it's like, you have not watched PBS in three years. You watch Worldwide Wrestling every Saturday, and you have not missed an episode of The Housewives of Little Rock since it came out. It's like, you've been lying to us all these years. And it's like, you yeah. know, well, we didn't want to seem that, that shallow. Um, so it's like, well, you are, so own it. Purchasing managers don't know enough to lie. So if you ask a purchasing manager, are you buying more or less steel? They'll say more. How come? I don't know. I don't even know what we make. Um, somebody tells me to buy more steel and we're out of toilet paper. I'm the merchant. You know, I don't know why I do anything. Somebody tells me to buy something and I buy it. It's like, do you think I'm going to walk up to my CEO and say, sir, why are we buying this? Shut up, Binkley, and do your job. Um, you're not paid to think that. Just go find a good price for the damn toilet paper. Um, and that's the end of the conversation. So it's accurate data, and it's also easy to read. It's the diffusion index that says anything over 50 is growth, anything under 50 is contraction. Back into growth numbers this last month, we were 47.9, not horrible, but not great. Now we're back up to 50. Mexico is above 50. Fastest growing economy for those last several has been India. Uh, India has seen its PMI just go nuts. Most of Europe still in mild decline, but not crisis. Um, Asia is starting to come back a little bit. So we had 20 countries that were in contraction in the previous month, but only 15 in January. So it's getting a little bit better. Inventories are becoming more stable. 60% um, of the market is overstocked. However, that's getting back to more normal rates. You know, you're still seeing certain sectors that are more in the overstock category, but the inventory to sales ratio numbers are beginning to look more normal. The challenge with supply chain now is not that it is as broken as it was a couple of years ago. It's select parts. So it's like 98% of what you need is there, and that 2% isn't. But that's keeping you. I mean, that plant that I toured in Cleveland, 
they're in the combustion business, so they manufacture all these these machines to do combustion work. And as we're touring the plant, the guy would stop and say, okay, here's a huge order that we're doing for a company in Korea. It's all ready to go, ready to ship, missing one part. Once that one part comes in and we put it on the machine, out they go. And that one part is worth 10 bucks. But we are stuck waiting for the one part. Without it, the machine doesn't work. And if you look at companies in aerospace, automotive, well, you know, customers are weird. You know, for some reason, people that fly want all the bolts on the plane, not just some of them. You know, I mean, so all of a sudden it's like, you know, got it, got, you know, people get weird when the door flies off. I mean, I don't know why it would seem to air out the plane, but whatever. We're seeing a lot of congestion in the supply chain. It isn't really having a huge effect on the U.S., at least the Red Sea mess isn't, because this is predominantly from Asia into Europe. Uh, but it has a follow-on effect in terms of, of how it's adding cost to the whole transportation thing. It's not as it was in the very beginning, because companies are just automatically rerouting around the Red Sea. And the issue is not really that the Houthi is capable of blowing up that many ships. It's just that you can't get insurance. The insurance companies are like, huh, uh you know, if there's a chance that this thing is going to get hit by a missile, we're not in play. And so ships are having to reroute around Africa. What's affecting the U.S. has been the Panama Canal drought. Um, that is still a major problem. There are still no prospects of significant rain. That has limited the number of ships that can go through the Panama Canal. It used to be around 35 a day. It's now about 18. So it's come down by almost half. And those that are making the trek have to offload a significant part of their cargo to get the draft appropriate to get through the canal. That's been very good news for some parts of the West Coast port environment. I mean, if you are now restricted going through the Panama Canal, it makes Lazaro Cardenas in Mexico a lot more appealing than it was before. Also, the West Coast ports in general. The West Coast ports have not been able to take advantage of it as much because they're at capacity already, but Lazaro is still relatively undeveloped, and that's had an impact on distribution. I'm in Kansas City, so we've been watching that merger like a hawk. So you've got Kansas City Southern and Canadian Pacific merging to create this north-south lane, which is anchored by Lazaro on the south and Vancouver in the north. And the estimate was that 800,000 to 1.7 additional containers arriving in the middle of the U.S. per week. So companies are just taking advantage of that new route. And that's where all that, you can just see the, the warehouse development all up and down the I-35 corridor. I mean, it's staggering. Every time you turn around in Kansas City, there's a new massive warehouse. And at first, people would look at it and say, well, yeah, okay, it's Amazon. That's what we would expect. But there is an enormous, I mean, huge, I think it's like almost a mile long warehouse not far from where i live that belongs to urban outfitters i mean it's a clothing company it's not amazon it's not walmart it's urban outfitters and they have a warehouse that you could operate a crane in you know so that kind of activity is is really driving a lot of development so broadly looking at manufacturing, we're still seeing some pretty good growth. Um, it's tapering off just a little, according to our numbers, about the middle of the year. But that's a pretty wide cone. And one of the things that we're watching with the cone, which would force it either north or south, has a lot to do with labor. It also has a lot to do with the demand and supply of commodities. So the manufacturing sector is reacting to the fact that the inventory crisis is kind of back to a more normal reorder cycle. And that slows down growth just a little, but not not dramatically. Big changes in oil. Um, and I don't want to go into a lot 
detail here, but the new watchword in oil is dynamic production. What used with oil production is that if you were going to anticipate a reduction in demand, getting your react to that limit. And then it was going to take you another year to bring it back to normal production. So the decisions about had in advance and had to be based on, on a lot of speculation. The way we produce oil now is so fast that you can literally react to the spot price. I mean, I do a lot of work, Dakota, and buttons with fracking and all the different ways that they produce oil. They just literally look at the spot price. I mean, they look at the price and it's like, hey, fire up, fire up. And so they start to produce. And a couple of days later, hey, burn, spot price went down, shut her down. You can open up a fracking operation in 24 hours. You can shut it down in 24 hours. So it's literally, yep, there's demand, turn her on. Nope, not anymore, turn her off. So there's no big peaks and valleys. The estimate now is that oil prices are going to stay in the 70s indefinitely. I mean, the oil sector is literally using words like perpetuity. They're basically saying, we do not see a period where oil prices get out of the 70s or low 80s. It would have to be a massive hurricane that destroys the Gulf infrastructure, a geopolitical conflagration that then eliminates. But I mean, look at what happened when the Hamas war started. The markets originally responded like this was the 1970s and oil prices are going to be 180 bucks a barrel. And they went up $4 and then dropped 5 It's like, you have a war in the Middle East. Why aren't oil prices going up? The oil producer says, because we don't care. We, we get oil from everywhere. It's like the U.S. is, is North American independent. We produce... 15, 16 million barrels a day ourselves, we consume around 20. And that which we don't get ourselves, we get from Canada or Mexico. So what do we care what Iran or Iraq or Saudi Arabia or anybody else does? And at the same time, the technology that has been allowing North Dakota to move where it is, Indonesia used to be one of the big oil producers in the world, but then it fell off. Indonesia is now using fracking, and they're coming right back to the top of that list. And just as a complete aside, but just something to stimulate our conversation, the emerging giant in Asia is now Indonesia. Indonesia has the third largest population in Asia. It's only behind China and India. The president of that country for the last 10 years has been Joko Widodo, and he has been systematically kind of fixing and repairing and, and getting the economy of Indonesia on track. Massive population, a lot of resources. It's already the world's largest nickel producer. They're replacing Jakarta. Jakarta is no longer going to be the capital of Indonesia, he's building and has built a new capital, Kalimantan, in the middle of the country, which is state-of-the-art, alternative energy, most modern development in all of Asia. His term comes to an end this year, but to indicate how secure his position is, his running mate, hand-selected, his or his successor, the successor's running mate is Joko Bodoro's son. So um, Widodo is not stepping too far away from power. But that's the country to watch. The global supply chain pressures have gotten worse because of the mess in the canal and, and Red Sea. But it's nowhere near what it was back because it's kind of back to norm in the last 20 years. Bank credit has gotten tighter but is beginning to sort of shoot back up. Banks are... They can't not lend. I mean, that's their business. They're not in a position to quit. I mean, it's not like they sit around and run their fingers through coins like Scrooge. They're, they've got to lend, and they're finding ways to get back into the market. They're anticipating that 
rate cut. And part of the challenge for the banks and all the lending community is that people think that rate cut will happen. Therefore, they're not going to go into debt now. Why? It's going to get cheaper later. So I'm going to hold off to see just how far those rates come down. I mean, if they really do come down three quarters of a point, well, that's pretty significant. And I'm going to go ahead and wait for the opportunity and then do my loans then. So the last couple of things to talk about, and then we'll leave some time for questions, is just, again, a, a not necessarily brand new development, but it's kind of accelerating. We now import more from Mexico than we do from China. The amount of money or the amount of exports coming out of China has dropped dramatically. Now, that will probably reverse a little bit this year because of the deflation there, but it's still an indication of how Mexico has really surged to the forefront. There has been a decline in foreign direct investment into China that has taken it back to levels not seen since the 1990s. Meanwhile, Mexico has never seen this much foreign direct investment. And it's coming from the U.S., from Korea, from Japan, even from China. So Mexico is beyond selling oil and food. They're now selling consumer goods into the U.S., transportation issues are still favoring Mexico. You look at all these companies that are trying to get their product through the Panama Canal and can't. It's like, well, now they're just dropping it in Mexico and moving north through Mexico and getting it into the U.S. that way. Mexico makes history this year because it will have its first female president by the middle of the year. The two that are running are in the two major parties, so it's either going to be Claudia Scheinbaum or Sochi Galvez. Claudia Scheinbaum, former mayor of Mexico City, she's with the Marin Party, which is the ruling party. She is much more of a technocrat. She's trained as a scientist, um, is actually more pro-business and more pro-American than her predecessor, AMLO, Andres Manuel Lopez Imperador. If she wins, and right now she's got about 60% vote share, she would be the first woman president of Mexico and the first Jewish president of Mexico. If her opponent, Sochi Galvez, wins, Sochi is with the PAN party, which has always been very powerful in the north. That's the party that brought us Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderon a few years back. PAN has always been limited by the fact that it is a party of the North, and it's a business party, and it's never had a lot of support outside the North. However, Sochi Galvez's father is indigenous Mexican Indian. So the southern Mexican population sees her as one of them. And so now, all of a sudden, PAN has support in the South and the North. If she wins, she'd be the first woman to win. She has 50% vote support right now and would be the first indigenous president of Mexico, at least partly indigenous. So either way, Mexico makes history and basically good for the U.S. because they're more attuned to doing business with the U.S. They also share our concern with immigration. We have never seen fewer Mexican immigrants coming into the U.S. The immigrants that are coming in are from Central America and Latin America, and the Mexicans don't want them either. They have been trying to stop them at their border. But their border is jungle, and trying to get control of routes through jungle, good luck. So they're very concerned about trying to figure out how to stem that migration, because once they get into Mexico, well, Mexico basically herds them north and said, look, we don't have room for you. We don't have jobs for you. Keep going. Um, I work a lot with the Border Patrol. And they said, look, the Mexican army is trying to be helpful. They stand on the other side of the river and say, they're from Guatemala, just a heads up, um, just so you know where they're coming from. Um, and we've got four million Venezuelans. I mean, it's just story that kind of summarizes it talking to a guy who's working on a sprinkler system and and it's like very heavy accent very good english and i said where are you from venezuela what are you doing here working illegally he says how come i was an accountant in caracas i had three mercedes i had a five-bedroom home i sent my daughters to the best schools in the world 
But then I made the mistake of calling Nicolas Maduro a horse's ass in public and was put on a death list. I had 24 hours to get out of Caracas or be killed. So a client had a friend in the United States and said, talk to him. So I'm living in Bill's basement now with my family, working on sprinkler systems, which I know nothing about. But if somebody would put a bullet between that SOB's eyes, I would go home to Venezuela tomorrow, along with four million of my closest friends. We don't want to be here. We are fleeing a tyrannical, stupid despot. Crying out loud, the man was a bus driver before he became the head of Venezuela. And he's got the intellect you would expect. So 70% unemployment in Venezuela. 70. It's like it's it's the crime capital of the universe because everybody is stealing from everybody. You know, it's like this guy was talking, he says, you know, you know it's bad when your 88-year-old mother tells you that she finally got a hold of food because she held up her neighbor. 88 years old, and she's waving a gun at her neighbor just to get food. That's why they're here, and the Mexicans are like, look, man, the issue isn't the border, and it, it's it's like somebody has to do something about drug gangs that are in these places. I mean, one of the countries, and I'm, I know I'm going off on a tangent, but one of the countries that has not had a big issue with immigration out of Central America has been El Salvador. And there used to be a lot of Salvadorans coming across the border, but that was before they got President Bukele. And not that I'm really sanctioning this draconian approach, but when he came to power, that was the issue. We are the crime capital of Central America. It's just ridiculous. In his term, he has arrested 76,000 people. And you probably saw the photos that were going around about Salvadoran prisons. These guys are stripped to their underwear. They're lined up in a crouch position with their face pushed into the butt of the guy in front of them. They are hosed down with a fire hose once a day and food is thrown to them in buckets like you were feeding pigs. And basically the government says, if you are involved with drugs, your life will become a living hell. Suddenly, the murder rate dropped to a minimal, not, it's, it's non-existent. And, and the migration out of Salvador stopped. People are saying, Yep, I'm quite sure they arrested some people that had nothing to do with drugs, but, you know, we got the point across. Thailand did that 10 years ago when Thaksin Shinawat, um, and he got in even more trouble because he didn't arrest him, he shot him. Um, there were 65,000 executions in one year. And suddenly Thailand was not the drug center that it had been before. I mean, it's a very, very brutal way of going after this, but Ecuador is dealing with it now. They just arrested 6,000 people in the last month um, trying to control the drug wars there. So it's a it's a incredibly nasty situation that's not getting nearly as much press as one would think. I mean, it's there's a lot going on in the world right now, but we're kind of not paying attention to some of the, the wars that are really quite a bit closer. So with that cheery end, um, I leave you with one last very important graph. This explains everything. Everything I just talked about for an hour. There it is. You know, it's all you have to do is understand this graph. and You got it made. Um, as mentioned in the intro, we do a lot of writing. I'm just as long winded in print as I am in public. Um, the flagship comes out three times a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday sells for the same price as a Starbucks caramel macchiato. Um, and then the watch is the thing that's been tracking the economy, transportation, retail, manufacturing, you name it. You can get that one for two months for free, so you can see if it would be useful. To be honest, it really is a useful tool. I mean, there's a lot of need to forecast pretty far out, and we've worked hard at making sure that this thing at least goes out two, maybe three quarters. And right now, when we're looking at that, kind of transition phase where, you know, when do businesses start to move? 
it's it's pretty useful stuff and the best part about it is that because of the system that that john set up when there is a change we know exactly why we know what variable changed and and john is constantly sending in things saying hey this just changed and when this changes it's going to show up in next month's list and so beyond the fact that it's a useful tool you know it was put together by one of your own one of your own coo people uh, so that gives it just immense legitimacy right down there. at least that's what chuck tells me you know so. any questions So I can hardly read that my eyes are so bad. So if there are if there are some good chat questions in there, if you would like to read them to me, that would be great. And then you won't have to see me doing this on my screen trying to read the chat. So Chris O'Rourke. All right. Well, first off, I just want to say thanks so much, Chris. I, I look forward to this session uh every time you are on the schedule. And uh if the whole economist thing doesn't work out for you, um definitely recommend you consider a comedy routine. Um, there you go. You'd be great at it. Um, so you mentioned um, kind of at the very beginning that um, the first two quarters of growth are really being driven by consumer spending the, mm -hmm. the on healthcare. Um, Josh, I know, is is as as um, is buying at least three or four yachts. So he's he's exactly that. Um, but then you also mentioned that you're you're seeing some decline in, in the third and fourth quarter. Um, mm -hmm. Boomers certainly are not going to, um, they are dying, but they're, they're not going to die so quickly that, that they're not going to, that will impact healthcare. Um, and Josh may be buying a, a fifth yacht. So um, what is, what is driving your, your concerns about a decrease, uh, a slowdown? Yeah. The variables that are changing that we're looking at affect that lower third. Um, the upper third is going to keep spending. The lower third is really starting to feel the pinch and you see that in in even terms of of kind of how the workforce participation has been changing and for the longest time after the pandemic and during the pandemic people kept asking where did everybody go i mean you had all these people that were working and then all of a sudden we can't find anybody where are they and many of them went into the gig economy they went into uber and lyft and doordash and all that those people are coming out of that sector really fast, as fast as they went in, because it doesn't make the money it used to. I mean, just looking at Uber as an example, four or five years ago, I mean, virtually every Uber driver I got was a retired guy. It was a fireman that was working on the side. It was some kid because they could decide to drive for a few hours, make some money and quit. The last couple of Uber drivers that I've talked to said, yeah, those days are over. Um, I sit in that airport parking lot. And it's like one guy said, so glad to get a ride today. I've been there for seven hours waiting for a ride. So I'm going to make one trip today. One. And so he said, I'm out. I'm, I'm, this is my last week of Ubering. Um, I'm going to go back to get a regular job because there's no money in it. There's too many people doing Uber. So they're dropping out of DoorDash or dropping out of Uber. Um, there's sectors that were kind of unique. Uh, I was talking to the Dry Cleaners Association at one point, and they said that their biggest threat was internet laundry. And I said, what the heck is internet laundry? He says, well, when the pandemic was in full swing and 7 million women got sent home to take care of their kids, well, they had to do something for money, and they learned that they advertised on the local internet that they would do other people's laundry. The average take-home was 350 bucks a day. So they looked at the post-pandemic period. I can go back to work, $15 an hour job, make 120 bucks a day and pay taxes, or I can do other people's laundry. And they stepped up, kept doing the laundry. But as the year has gone on their main customer was millennial males and little by little they were dropping out so these women now were needing to go back and get a regular job because the laundry work wasn't adding up so what we're seeing is that lower third beginning to feel much more of the inflation pinch 
becoming a little bit more affected by layoffs because the worker shortage is primarily skilled, educated workers. And businesses have been able to cope with labor shortage at the lower end because that's what machines can do. And that's what AI can do. So you start to look at like this manufacturing group that I was talking to in Cleveland, they said, yeah, we were dealing with worker shortage. We still are for skilled people, but those people who were kind of our basic factory workers, we replaced them all with machines. We ended up firing 30 of them because we don't need a person driving a forklift. It drives itself. You know, we put down the strip, and it just knows where to go, and AI programs it. We don't need people to unload pallets anymore. That's done automatically. So the lower-end worker is the one that's beginning to see their job opportunities dry up. Anything else? Gee, every every answer will get you this long-winded you know, dissertation. I could go on for weeks. So. Chris, uh, we have uh, Josh. Uh, Josh, with a question. Not really a question, just a comment, right? It's <clears throat> how much of that is uh, related to the the unskilled, educated worker that's now feeling the pinch of student loans suddenly being back in their budget, mm -hmm. and their credit cards are now maxed out because they haven't readjusted their right. living. Uh, you know, the way that they live based on now I got to pay this $600, you know, month fee for this art education that I have that allows right, me to get right. bucks. Yeah. And, and you get a real breakdown between those three categories because the, the lower third, they're not dealing with student loans because they never went to college anyway. Um, you know, they're like, no, you know, that never was an option. So I didn't borrow any money. However, I am in the category that I didn't want to give up my consumer behavior, so I just kept using my credit card. So that $7 trillion worth of credit card debt is largely in the hands of the lower two-thirds. The ones that are being affected by student loans are in the middle. And, and so that's why there's a lot of worry, because that's the group that could either drift a little bit north or drift a little bit south. And because they're the ones that went to school, they're the ones who are facing a student loan. And unfortunately, students being students, um, back in the Stone Age when I got student loans, I never saw a dime of that money. It went straight to the school and paid my tuition. Now, all of a sudden, you know, when the government took it over, you got a check and it was like, you do whatever you want. And those same students well, they also use their credit cards up to the max, and and so they're carrying all of this debt related to the the student loan, and part of it related to just, well, you know, you got to have money for the weekend. Uh, so, but that's that's another concern. That and the fact that just normal stuff. I mean, the price of a car, you know, forty six thousand, blah blah blah. People for the most part, looked at their obligations and all they focused on was the monthly payment. And and then it's like, okay, well, that's fine, but <laughs> you still owe all this money. Um, and so as long as the, as the labor market stays halfway healthy, people can handle it, but it's getting less and less healthy for that bottom third. Um, Chris, we have a question from uh, Kaylee Welch. Um, do you have any insights into the creator economy? The what economy? The creator economy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The creator economy is, it has a lot of, of potential because one of the, the big conversations, AI is is either going to be a toy in the hands of some people or an integral part of their operation. And within the creative community, there's a lot of debate as to how to use AI and how to make it an integral part of the business without detracting from the core business. And and it's still kind of a, uh, the jury is still out. I mean, as people look at what AI can do, it's it's like, well, if AI can write and if AI can create and if AI can do all this stuff, then who actually needs the people who can do this? I mean, 
you've had that debate going on with the animators for many years. Um, it becomes, I think, a matter of adapting and figuring out how to use that latest tool and, and make it a productive part of the operation. What is likely to happen is what's been happening with, say, accounting, which is not exactly in the creator committee, community. But what accountants have seen with AI is that it's a very powerful tool for them. But what it does to the profession is that what used to take four accountants now takes one because the one can use AI to do what used to be done by four. And so it's it's great if you're controlling it, but if you were the one replaced by it, then it's a different story. Anything else? Chuck has frozen on me, so I'm, I'm not sure if anybody else is frozen or not. Am I back? You're back. You're back. All right. All right, good. We have a question from uh, Lori Roberts. Uh, what are your thoughts on the commercial real estate sector declining occupancy, debt, and the financial sector impacts? Yeah, it's going to be all over the place because commercial real estate on the supply chain, logistics, warehouse, still booming, still going to boom throughout the course of the year. Healthcare-oriented stuff, still booming. Um, big office buildings, still in the tank. Retail still in the tank. Um, retail is still adapting to the fact that we're more and more comfortable with online. And the non-residential construction is still pretty vibrant. What is happening with the sector as a whole is that they're delaying until they know what's happening with interest rates. So we have a lot of construction clients, and they're saying, we've got a lot of projects that we're on on the books and we're going to do them we're definitely going to do them but timing is the question you know we're not going to go and try to get them financed now because we figured this is the peak it's not going to get any worse than it is now as far as financing but it's not getting better yet but by the end of the year it could so we're basically telling everybody yeah we're going to do it but not this quarter probably not next quarter only going to be third or fourth quarter before we start getting into this. Um, you're seeing on the commercial side also following population. So in certain parts of the country, it's in the tank and not going anywhere regardless. But other parts of the country, it's like, wow, we're in surge mode and, and we're definitely going to have to try to keep up with this. I mean, just one, again, stupid story have a friend in Fremont, Nebraska, who's the city manager and goes down to his office one day and there's a Chinese guy waiting in his lobby. And he says, can I help you? Yes, sir. I'm moving to Nebraska. Okay. Uh, how come? I manufacture agricultural equipment and my customers are here. China is passing a new law and going to tax me at 100% for a certain amount. I do not plan to give 100% of my money to the Chinese government. I'm moving here. And I have some big customers in the area. Oh, what, what do I have to do? And the guy from Fremont says, well, first you need to support Husker football. But after that, um, we'll, we'll talk. He said, what do you need from me? And he says, I have 100 employees coming next week. And the guy this is Fremont, dude. You know, Tell them to bring sleeping bags. We don't have place for you in a week. Um, but I'll tell you what, the housing developer from Omaha was up there the next day going, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get them built for you as fast as I possibly can. Do you mind having paper walls? Um, you know, I mean, it's just I can get those suckers up there. And the guy that was ahead of the builder was the guy that sells mobile homes. And and he said, I'll, I'll deliver you 100 mobile homes by Tuesday. And so that's that's going to be the kind of stuff that drives commercial. It's not going to be, it's like everything else in real estate. It's local, local, local. And, and you can look at national numbers and then go someplace where they just laugh at you and say, you're not from around here, are you? So it's like, yeah. So...
Great question. Uh, any other uh, questions from the group? Final call. Last call. Too bad it's not last, last call. call for alcohol, you know. <laughs> but it's Friday. We're getting close. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we'll we'll wrap things up. So first off, if you get a chance, come off of uh, come on to video and uh, let's give Chris a, a round of applause and thank you for uh, once again giving us a uh, a tremendous amount of value at the CO Forum. I know every every visit is 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 special, so we appreciate it. So thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks to Laura and Fiona for setting all this up and making it happen. So thank you. I also want to thank all of our amazing members, as always, for uh, showing up and um, and learning with us on our presenter sessions, and also to our guests. So uh, a big welcome to all of our guests. We love to see you see you month after month. So if you haven't filled out an application and uh, or talked with Laura or your director, please do. Um, I'm going to make this offer that uh, anyone on a call today, uh, guest or member that. Um, reaches out to at least five people on this call, you're gonna get a list of names and, and contact information. But if you reach out to at least five people, uh, we'll pay for a uh, subscription to um, to the corporate brief from Armada. Uh, I get it uh, uh, you know, weekly and I love reading it. Uh, we do post it out onto our uh, e-form from time to time, uh, but um, I'll make that offer. So connect with five people and we'll, we'll buy you a subscription. Um, and one last shout out to the COO Forum. The only Christmas party I was invited to last year was a COO Forum party. So there you go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> We're all great people and we love the party. Very uh, good. And thank then just, you guys. Just, yeah, thank, thank I'm gonna you. I'm going to go to another call, believe it or not. So, okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and just a, a few minutes, uh, just a few more seconds, actually. So February 14th, if you got nothing going on for Valentine's Day, if you aren't at a gas station uh, shopping for a gift, uh, we have a workshop, uh, Mastering the Art and Science of the CEO, COO Relationship with Megan Flaherty. That's on February 14th, um, 1 p.m. Eastern. And then on February 23rd, uh, we've got the executive session. Um, Josh, I believe you're leading the executive session this month. Okay, super. Um, you don't want to miss that. That's at 1030 on Friday, February 23rd. Um, and then lastly, make sure you're getting out to your um, to your regular chapter meetings. Um, show some love to your chapter director who puts in so much time and energy to, um, uh, to put on a great meeting for you. Um, I think that's it. Did I freeze it all? No, nope, you're good. Those are all Eastern times, it? by the way. Eastern times. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So um, wonderful seeing everybody. Uh, give you a few minutes back. Uh, have a fabulous weekend and uh, great seeing you all. Take care.